Greetings and salutations, listeners and viewers. Welcome to episode 91 of Word Ninjas Live. I am your instigator of literary and creative insanity and occasional productivity, but mostly distractions, Charles. And joining me tonight are Will. Hello. And Calvin. Hi. Everybody else is distractimicated today, so it's just the three of us tonight. But we still have a show to do, so we're going to do it. And kicking things off is our talkie point for the week, which is, are there any stories you'd like to see reworked with new aspects or time periods? And the examples that came to mind for me were stuff like from Quirk Press, like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters. Uh, and one that I'm reading now, not from them, but A Midsummer's Night Steampunk which is weird, but in a fun way. And while not technically called Hercules in Space, that's what the Andromeda TV show was. It was Kevin Sorbo in space, beating people up, because Hercules in space. <laughs> but it made me think, how many other stories are there out there that if you reworked them by adding in other things, how would those combinations work? Are there some good ones out there? Or the, I'm sure there are bad ones out there, or ones that kind of fell short of expectations, because that always happens in books and movies and TV shows and everything else. But Those were just the ones that came to mind quickly for me. Does anyone else on our little crew have others to add as we make this an open round table rather than just one after another. I've been thinking about it for a while and I'm still not sure. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of stories that are now in the public domain through one reason or another. Stuff which is partly why stuff like Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters exist. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how some of the classics, if you added other aspects to them, not even necessarily monsters, but put them in a different time period. You can make them modern, you can make them futuristic. It's done often enough, but trying to think of examples offhand is a little tricky. I mean, there are pretty common storylines that are continuously reworked. Like, every single rom-com in existence is pretty much the same plot when it all comes down to it. There are a few standouts, of course, but... Even Shakespeare. What if you took Shakespeare but put it in the future? I know there are examples of you. that. Yeah. Uh, what did you say, Will? Ten Things I Hate About You is a modern adaptation of Taming of the Shrew. Mm. I liked that one. It was good. Never seen that one. It's worth a watch if you have the time. Yeah. I wouldn't say you're drastically missing anything, but if you find the time and you watch it, you'll probably find it enjoyable. Mm. Heath Ledger's in it. I think you had fun with that role, too. It looks like you did. The scene where he sang the song out in the bleachers <laughs> and the security <laughs> guards come chasing after him. <laughs> and there's an know. infinite amount of Romeo and Juliet renditions out there with different things added in to try and change it up. I haven't watched many of those, though. I'm not a big fan of Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Hmm. And I know all the stuff from like Grim Fairy Tales and Hans Christian Andersen, there have been plenty of adaptations for those. Hmm. I 
I can't think of any off the top of my head though. I've been thinking about it for a while mm -hmm. now. You know, a lot of them are more just adaptations, really taking the very core of the storyline, but putting it in a new time period, adding other aspects to mix it up. But stuff like uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, it really is Pride and Prejudice, only if there was a zombie outbreak. For the most part, the main storyline is just all there. All the characters remain the same, only how would they act if zombies were present or if one of them happened to become zombified. Hmm. That was a very weird read. I can kind of understand why most people are not exactly sold on that one or the various <laughs> others. It really is two different styles now that I think about it. I think the stuff like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is definitely a smaller pool of examples than the more common adaptations. I imagine this might have been done already, but like maybe a version of uh, H.G. Wells' is A Time Machine with people from 2015 instead of 1900. I would think that someone's tried that by now, but I can't think of an example. Uh, neither can I. Perhaps our viewers and listeners can help us. If you do happen to know of anything like that or any other examples, by all means, post in the comments accordingly. That would be interesting. I'd been thinking recently, no specific stories, but taking fantasy themes and putting them in more Victorian era. What sort of fantasy themes? Like the usual, like, dragons and elves and magic and blah, 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 blah. It's all in the fantasy setting with forests and castles and all that kind of stuff. What if you had all that, but it was in Victorian England instead? So you had, like, steam-powered technology and almost electricity and cobbled streets and not forests everywhere, but just buildings everywhere. And it's dreary and rainy. I feel like one of I feel like one of the books I got from Book Expo America last year might fit that description. I have to go back and check. Yay! I'm not alone with such thoughts. <laughs> I've actually about, I was actually thinking of uh, my own characters, my uh, a weird little story verse I had in my head that originally was fantasy based, and as I was thinking, I was like. Well, does it have to be fantasy-based just because I've got, like, a lich and a demon? Why couldn't it take place in Victorian era or, like, steampunk something, but there's still, like, a demon and a witch? I, I, I mean, demons and undead could exist at any time period. Yeah, why not? I've occasionally tried to figure out the concept of what if magic and elves and other fantasy elements were in like the year 3000 in space when there's you not a forest liked, around you might have liked the concept to Hellgate London then because it takes place in the future but the world has been overrun by demons and the humans are surviving underground but because the demons came about there's now magic so magic guns <laughs> I'm intrigued it was interesting. Some of the people who worked on it had worked on Diablo and Diablo 2. Nice. I don't know if you can still play it anymore. I mentioned it a while back, and Justin was like, yeah, the servers don't work anymore because the game is kind of old and wasn't super popular when it first came out. Hmm. But uh, the single-player campaign may or may not still work. I don't know. I'll have to take a look. Add it to my never-ending list of Game Break stuff, because why not? <laughs> Although I'm slowly whittling that down, just because some of the storylines in some of those games are rather short. <laughs> or just open-ended. Fun. Yeah, the last game I played is more of an adaptation in that it is mini-golf, but steampunk. 
and in the sky because reasons. Hmm. I have to watch that. <laughs> Uh, episode one of two is uploaded onto our drive. Episode two is probably uploading at the moment. But the only reason I recorded that one is because there was a storyline, although a very confusing one. Because there's only so much you can do with a steampunk mini golf to make a story. <laughs> Trying to think of other examples, but nothing's really coming to me. This is trickier than I expected it to be. Then again, I seem to come up with those types of questions. Either it confuses everyone, or we can't figure some uh, viable answer for it. Part of the reason why the Assassin's Creed series is so popular. It's the same game, but each one takes place in a different time period. <laughs> <laughs> Well, slightly different characters. Yeah, it's the same concept, though. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I can't think of any other examples, uh, so... Again, to our viewers and listeners, by all means, post in the comments if you have others. Or if there's anything that we blatantly missed that we should have thought of, let us know. Remind us. Because this, it is an interesting concept and a differentiation between the whole adaptation concept versus not shoehorning stuff in. That seems a bit rough, but... The whole Pride and Prejudice and Zombies concept of fitting another thing in while keeping most of the story pretty much intact. All right. With that, might as well roll into the highlights reel. Because why not? So, to the screen share... I said to the screen share, come on now. There we go. All right, first one up is another infographic because they're amusing. And this one is the step-by-step -step directions for writing your next piece of content. It's primarily written from a business perspective, but it does correlate to basically all styles of writing, as it kind of alludes to. Because, I mean, you got to start things off with a goal. Just what do you actually want to try and write about? And then framing it, figuring out just how you want to put it together, what format, is it going to be a novel, novella, poem, song, whatever. And kind of figure out the whole layout, beginning, middle, end if there's any data or examples or other stuff that you want to toss into it to help flesh it out. Organization is useful. Some are more proactive about that than others. The right to one person, I would kind of phrase it as right for yourself. Write the piece that you would want to read first, because if you are engaged, then chances are your readers will be engaged. But first, you got to get the ugly draft out, or the crap draft as I call it. And then give it time, because your brain is going to need time to kind of figure out just what you've put down onto paper, figurative or literal, if it's on a computer. Let it sort of figure out all the bits and pieces that could be reworded, rephrased, moved around, etc. That takes a little time. You can't do it immediately after 
writing the end or finishing the last line or anything. And then, of course, rewrite as many times as necessary. And kind of like how a cover of a book does give an impression, even though you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, that's the first thing you're going to see. You're going to see the headline or title first as well. So make it in some ways relevant to what you've written. If it's completely abstract, then it's probably going to confuse a few people. Or many people. Or everyone, for that matter. So put a little thought into that. And it does help to have someone else edit, because everything is in your head. So even if you don't write everything in your head down onto paper, your head's going to fill in those gaps when you're rereading and editing it. You need an outside perspective to kind of spot bits and pieces that either don't line up, are missing, are kind of in there but unnecessary. That's why I have a five-person crew to catch all of my silly mistakes when I'm doing writing prompts and stuff because it makes sense in my head but not necessarily in anyone else's. And the one final read-through is always useful just because there's always that one last thing that is either mistyped or, oh, maybe you could tighten it up this way or, oh, you wanted to add that one last thing. It helps to do one last pass through. And then, of course, get it out there in whatever format and media content you want. Get it published, even if it's through Tumblr or social media or self-publishing, however you want to go about it or however you can. Share your stuff. You put all your work into it. You might as well be able to share it with others so that they can appreciate it. Next one up, the Ultimate Web Typography Guide, which is over on TNW News, which has a somewhat funky layout that I've been fighting whenever I was looking at this site, but it's actually pretty cool once it plays nice. This is basically just a whole list of typography-based websites, like Typography Daily, Typography. Typographic Posters, which is a really cool site and fun to look through. Of course, Typostrate, Friends of Type, a few Tumblr pages as well. It's basically just an aggregated list of very interesting typographic websites for you to peruse. And there are plenty of them. And a fair amount of them that I've not looked at before. And uh, actually, the uh, design.tutsplus.com, that one's fun also for the fact that tutsplus.com is a fantastic website. It has tutorials on everything imaginable. It's a great resource to just scroll through and find interesting things about type typography, design, illustration, art in general. It has everything. Definitely worth looking at. I've learned quite a bit from that website. So have I. It can be a bit of a time suck, though, because you'll just stay on there forever. I can think of worse things. <laughs> yeah, same here. I'm kind of a fan of design history just because... Even though I suck at history, like, please don't ask me to do a history course, I will do horribly. I'm still fascinated by it. It's interesting to see the history and reasoning behind how things have come to be. So like Design History is a very interesting website. I can lose a lot of time on that one. Never been to that one. I gotta check that one out. It's kind of fun. You also have Type Horn. Dot org. Bonus points for the uh, creativity on that one. Mm. The list just keeps going. So as you can see, it's a pretty solid list. And there's also some promo blogs for types. 
really a little bit of everything. Definitely worth checking out. Something for everyone. Yes. And the next piece is from Dungeons and Dragons. Basically their next expansion pack, as it were, for D&D 5 or whatever number they're up to is coming out, but it's also going to be a computer game, which I'm excited for. And I feel like there was another format it was coming out in. But the main storyline kind of a computer console or tabletop. Well, all three. But we get to see some of the uh, Drizzt storylines in here, which is always fun. Especially if they add some of his friends, which they better. And another piece that I saw in here was that uh, Neverwinter may be getting another expansion, which I have never finished a Neverwinter game, just like I've never finished a Fallout game or a Bioshock game or any of the other games that I really enjoy and have incredible stories. I just never finished them. But Neverwinter was an incredible one, and I want more of that. So I'm excited for that. And I would be up for playing the tabletop version of Out of the Abyss if we can get it recorded for all the shenanigans that I'm sure we'd get up to. As long as there's no glue pots. Please don't let there be glue pots. My poor character. Eep. <laughs> One of these days we're actually going to rescue my character after he got kidnapped after being knocked unconscious because Justin ran away. Mm. One of these days. Yeah, my character did not exist yet or at that point, or I just oh I just wasn't there for that one. Yeah, you were probably still at the inn having a drink or something. You weren't there to join us. We needed a tank. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited for this. I look forward to the fall to see just how what comes out of all this. And next up, a fun piece over at the Mary Sue talking about the 17th century writer Margaret Cavendish, who I didn't really know much about, but they gave some fun little bullet points to kind of explain why she's such a badass. She was the first woman to actively seek out publication under her own name. That within itself is impressive, especially for the 17th century when women didn't really have the power to do much. Barely anything. So to be able to try and get publicated or published, not publicated, that's not a word, published under her own name rather than just a pen name, that's, that takes guts. And she was also the first woman to visit the Royal Society, and she freaked them out. They deserve that. But apparently she kind of scared them to the point where it would take 300 years before another woman was allowed to visit. So she must have made some impression. Yes. Mm. <laughs> and it also claims that she wrote the first piece of science fiction called The Blazing World. Ooh. Blazing World is part science fiction, part fantasy, and part utopia with a good helping of WTF. I'm Sounds sold. Like right up our alley. I kind of want to read this now. <laughs> what is the plot? A beautiful young woman is kidnapped and brought to another world connected to Oz at the North Pole. She encounters talking animal scholars like Spider Men. Bear men and parrot men. Nice. These animals teach the lady about the new world and introduce her to the emperor, who falls in love with her and makes her the empress. And the empress's name? Margaret Cavendish. <laughs> 
she put herself into her own story, which they write down here potentially makes her the first Mary Sue character. I am okay with this. There has to be a first. I am looking for the ebook version of this. If there's an ebook version, we need to add that link into the show notes, and I may need to get a copy. Because this sounds most entertaining. Yeah, it's fun to get these little summaries of interesting authors from the 17th century, especially one who accomplished so much. And the last news highlight is the Five Star Stories manga finally gets its first new volume in nine years. And considering the detail of the artwork that they put together for the mechs in this manga, I am not surprised. I feel like the details in the artwork puts even Gundam to shame half the time. Oh, really? Yeah, this one... I want to read Five Star Stories, because when I was reading this blurb about it, I was really intrigued. It started back in 1986. So it's been around for a while, but it takes a long time, I guess, for a full volume to be compiled. And they said the Western equivalent is Frank Herbert's Dune. So it's on that scale. Hmm. Which makes me kind of surprised that I haven't heard of it before. Because I don't think Richie has shouted at me about it yet. At least not that I remember. But Then again, memory of Swiss cheese and all. (laughs) But it was interesting that it seems like the mechs are... require two pilots. The main combat controller, who apparently is usually male and a biological computer that handles most of the subconscious movement, which apparently is genetically engineered to be female, because why not? And because it was 1986, so I'm sure it was an interesting selling point to have giant mechs controlled by a male human and then a biological or biomechanical female. why not yeah and apparently it, it even had a one off anime movie back in the 80s hmm. I'm sure there are clips of that on YouTube because there are clips of everything on YouTube at this point <laughs> let's see the English release goes up to the 10th volume in the series currently but omits the newer arc that the Japanese Japanese release has. So, as usual, the English release is a bit behind. They've only had, like, nine years to catch up. Yeah. I don't know how many volumes are in the Majestic Stand arc. It didn't give that detail, and I didn't have time to... It said something read. about, uh, this is the 13th volume coming out, so... Okay. So, probably two or three volumes already in that arc, at least. Yeah. But I admit, I have never heard of this manga series before. Not even whispers of it. So I'm not sure how well known it is here. Which may be one of the reasons why it's been slow to be translated. Hmm. But I mean, there are plenty of online places, like Crunchyroll, where it's pretty easy to get a translated version up digitally for more for a smaller cost than the print versions. So even if they had to go that route, I would think that would be better than nothing. But that's just me. So if you're a fan of manga and a fan of mech manga, definitely seems like it's worth checking out, especially if there's already 10 volumes out in the US, unless you happen to be able to read in other languages, in which case, good for you. And can you teach us? (laughs) because I know places where I can get Japanese manga 
in Japanese, and they are always cheaper cost per cost-wise than the translated versions. But I can't read Japanese. At least not yet. Ah. All right. Those are the news highlights. Next up are the latest book bundles because they've updated and they're worth talking about. Over at Story Bundle is what are they naming it? The Right Stuff Bundle. And since you're listening to a literary podcast, this seems pretty relevant. Now, for $15 or more, you get 11 books and a 40% discount code on a piece of e-publishing software called Juto. I looked at Juto, and it looks like a pretty solid e-publishing software that normally runs for about 40 bucks and they have a premium version that's 80 bucks that gives you a few more options for how you can format it. I'm not sure if the discount code works for either one or just one of them. It didn't give those details, unfortunately. But if you do $14.99 and under, you get six books, like The Novel Writer's Toolkit by Bob Mayer, Writing into the Dark by Dean Wesley Smith, Playing the Short Game, How to Market and Sell Short Fiction by Douglas Smith. I've seen that one around. I think that one's pretty good and pretty useful from what I've seen. Making Tracts, a writer's guide to audiobooks, which we could use for some of our endeavors. Ah, uh, yeah. Rejection, Romance, and Royalties by Laura Resnick. Laura Resnick is a fantastic writer, so I'm sure this book is equally a good read. You have Business for Breakfast, Volume 1, The Beginning Professional Writer by Leigh Cutter. And if you do 15 or more, you get the extra five books. 30 Days in the Word Minds by Chuck Wendig. Okay, if Chuck Wendig wrote it, it's got to be really good, but it may be laced with well, not even laced. It's going to be filled with profanity. <laughs> Chuck Wendig does not mince words. You also have Pitfalls of Writing Fantasy by Vanda and McIntyre. I could use that one. The Right Attitude by Christine Catherine Roosh. Writing Horses. The Fine Art of Getting It Right by Judith Tarr. And Break Writer's Block Now by Jared, Gerald Mundus. For $15, 11 books and a 40% discount on a piece of software, that's pretty damn good. I may have to get this one. And by may, I mean, yeah. But I'll have to wait until Friday, because that's payday. Thankfully, as of this live stream, you have 22 days, 3 hours, 55 minutes, and 48 seconds to get it. So you still have plenty of time. But considering some of the authors and some of the topics in here, it's definitely worth looking at, and most likely worth the uh, investment, if you're listening to this podcast. And over at Humble Bundle, not writing-based, but definitely creative-based, they have the Humble Make Book Bundle, which is three, seven, six, eight, I should have counted beforehand, 13 pieces with more coming. You can pay whatever you want for the first five. And if I remember correctly, Make is more of uh, like a trade publish or a trade magazine style thing. So you have Making Makers, Kids, Tools, and the Future of Innovation. Tinkering, Kids Learn by Making Stuff. Making Simple Robots, Exploring Cutting Edge Robotics with Everyday Stuff. 
Make Technology on Your Time, Volume 41, Tinkering Toys. And Leo the Maker Prints, Journeys in 3D Printing. Those you can get for whatever price you choose. But if you pay the average, currently $13.38, that's always changing depending on who's buying what at what price. You get another six plus whatever else they toss in before the time runs out. So you could also get rockets, down to earth rocket science, electronics, learning by discovery. Long you don't get electrocuted. Yeah, we learned that one the hard way. <laughs> yeah. Fashioning technology, a do it yourself intro to smart crafting. That's interesting. Basic Arduino projects. 26 experiments with microcontrollers and electronics. I need that one. Schools Out Summer Fun Guide. 3D glasses compatible. Interesting. And also, Getting Started with Raspberry Pi, the second edition. I need that one as well. Now, if you go all out and pay $15 or more, you get two more. The Best of Make magazine, which I can barely read but says 75 projects, and Zero to Maker, Learn, just enough to make just about anything. <laughs> That's a pretty solid mix, all things considered. A little something for everyone. And again, for 15 bucks... You get all of that, plus whatever else they toss in before time runs out. And you currently have 13 days, 17, min 17 hours, 52 minutes, and 26 seconds as of this live stream. So a little under two weeks. So who knows what else they're going to toss in before then. I think that's enough books for anyone. And then some. Yes. And those are all of the highlights for this week. All of the links are in the show notes. And I see in our internal chat, someone found the blazing world. Yes. The, Is that free uh, to download? It's a, it's a book. Uh, it was a book that was published in 1666. It's public domain. Fair enough. <laughs> but uh, hat tip to the University of Adelaide for not only make uh, not only making a website version of this, but also EPUB and Kindle versions as well. So it's the blazing world. All right, adding the link to the show notes. I mean to the. Yeah, to the show notes, but on the website, updating. The link is now on the show notes for everyone to check out. Should they want to go read that. Hey, we got a few uh, comments on YouTube here. I saw, but considering I was screen sharing, I didn't want to go to that tab. Do you want to read through them? Because I'm still catching up. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Sharon Hanley has a list of books for Will with uh, Victorian meets fantasy. She says, if you want dragons in Victorian England, The Smoke Thief is uh, was a good read. Check it out. As will I. <laughs> and as will I, because otherwise I'll hear about it on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> see in response to the uh, to the uh, five star stories manga <laughs> uh, winter writes genetically engineered female because boobs because plot <laughs> everybody reads it for the plot <laughs> the nice bouncy plots <laughs> can they bounce if it's a manga 
I, it's implied. I think, no, I think there's no other choice. Just shake the book up and down. <laughs> I didn't know it was that type of interactive. <laughs> it's Japan. They come up with everything. Weird Fair and unusual. Point. There'll be a day when there are e-versions of manga where you can just shake your Kindle and the image will shake. <laughs> I would give that type of technology about five minutes before it gets horrifyingly inappropriate. <laughs> Maybe four minutes. Let's see. I believe this was in response to our uh, talkie point uh from earlier, Daryl Green says, "You want to know shoehorn guy? Combine the worlds of fairy tale and Devil May Cry. Do they look like they work?" That would be a horrifying world. <laughs> and again, Devil May Cry is a horrifying world within itself. All right. Do, 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 do. Any other comments worth commenting? I think we covered the. Uh, I think we covered the uh, uh, the more relevant ones. All right. Need. Let's see here. That means it's time for the productivity and inspiration station. Yeah. It's a little more cheerful than last week. As for myself, I've been busy this week, one, catching up on everything, because I'm behind, but mainly nothing but steampunk. I played Vertiginous Golf, a steampunk mini-golf-in-the-sky game, which there's like two hours worth of Game Break content for that. I'm working on a steampunk choose your own novel choose your own adventure visual novel because why not and for whatever reason I started reading a Midnummer, Midsummer's Night steampunk which is just weird intriguing but weird and I'm only about a quarter of the way through so I have no idea how that's going to play out and I'm finally making steady progress on Weird Ninjas 2.0. The formatting is slow and frustrating, but I'm figuring out just how I want it all to play out, which is good. And it should be ready in time to be unveiled for Kineticon, or else. Speaking That's of great. or else, I've been doing nothing but Doom editing of Doomy Doomed This at work, with a side order of Doom. Doom. I'm very glad that it's mostly over. It's mostly over, except for the other project that is now refilled with doom because equations were parenthetical wrong. And when you do that in Excel, it doesn't work well. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta get your, uh, you gotta get your equations on the money with Excel or. Bad things happen. Very bad things. Yeah, especially when there's 600 companies to keep track of across 14 years now. If you get some of the numbers wrong, you start pulling the wrong companies for wrong reasons, and then you get confused and can't figure out why <laughs> until you figure out why. Thankfully, that moment was not recorded for posterity because no one should have to see that reaction. It was not pretty. <laughs> hey, Will, how have things gone for you? Yay, I caught a cold over the weekend. Boo. Yay. Good times. Still somewhat recovering from that with the sniffles and the runny nose, but the worst of it is gone. 
No more scratchy throat and crazy dizziness. Excuse me. And despite all that, I managed to do more of all the audio editing. Yay. Yay for more Word Ninjas Live to be edited. Yay. I shall post those up tonight. Yay. I also finished that scene of Roommate that I was stuck on for like a week. Yay. It's gone. Hooray. I don't know. Maybe being sick helped me figure out what I need to do or what, but I just finally wrote out and finished it. Yay. Now on to an uber feels scene because feels and angst. <laughs> no. Yes. And it's technically productive, but not productive at the same time. I've, I've beaten both Borderlands 2 and Borderlands, the pre-sequel, again. <laughs> Are you going to be Borderlands 1 again as well? That would take longer because that game is less fun and more tedious. Uh, I have a I have a roll in that's about halfway through it, but there's still a decent amount to go through, and it's just slower paced. Everything feels slower about Borderlands One when compared to Borderlands Two, and there's fall damage. And there's fall damage. And they don't give you enough stats for the gun, so you really can't compare them properly. So they only tell you, like, three things for the guns. <laughs> mm. It's like how much damage it does, how accurate it is, and how much ammo it holds. That's it. Whereas Borderlands 2 tells you all that, and what the recoil is like, and what the reload speed is like. Another there's elemental shenanigans with it. Yeah. Uh and it describes the elemental stuff in Borderlands one weird. It'll say what it does it and then there's a multiplier. Like yeah, times one, confused. times two. I'm not exactly sure what that means. <laughs> it does stuff. Yeah, that's what I figured. I, and I, I guess if it's like fire times two is better than fire times one. I just don't know exactly what it's doing, but whatever. I don't know, it just feels slower. Like I don't know, it's weird. It's just a weird mm -hmm. feel. I can't explain it. Possibly because no matter what part of the game you're in, everything looks the same. <laughs> It's all Mad Max style desert wasteland from beginning to end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except for the very, very end where you get some snow. Because <laughs> you actually go up in a mountain. Hmm. So there's some snow, but everything else is just desert wasteland. Whereas Borderlands 2 has a wide variety of environments. <laughs> As does the pre sequel. Eh, I would agree. It's mostly the moon. Well, there's the ship and then the moon, or whatever you start off on. The space station. It's yeah. pretty much just the moon and the space station. Well, fair enough. I haven't. <laughs> I've just gotten to the damn moon and <laughs> run, run around in circles for most of the time that I've gotten there. I haven't really done much. The moon is impressive. It is fun to be on the moon and look up and see space and feel like you're on the moon. I like the moon parts. I don't have time to look up and see the sights. I'm too busy running away from all the stupid rock monster things throwing <laughs> things at me. Kill them all, then take a moment to look up at the stars. <laughs> it's hard, because I'm low level. It's hard because they're rock monsters? Oh, for... <laughs> Hey, Calvin, what have you been up to this last week? <laughs> um, not a whole lot more than uh, the previous week, but a little more. 
I uh, tried to get some more music going. I now have four ideas in the works for Infinity's Light. Oops. Including, uh, including two remixes. Cool. Oh. Which, interestingly enough, will be part of will be part of uh, for, like, furthering uh, the current stories and the strips that we have going right now. So that's exciting. I got some more reading done. I finished. Uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Vampire Slayer. Surprisingly good book. <laughs> cool. And in non-creative news and non-creative endeavors, I found a shaving method that did not make my face incredibly sad for days and weeks after the fact. Hooray. I was using one of those uh, fancy rotary blade razors, but I would have ingrown hairs all over my face that I would have to try to uh, try to alleviate basically every day, which is what happens when every single hair in your face decides to grow inside, <clears throat> grow inward, which is That's always unpleasant. To... Just a bit. I decided, <clears throat> excuse me. I decided to go a uh, a decidedly old school method, and I purchased a double uh, double edge safety razor. Hmm. So instead of three, four, five, twenty three blades on a razor, hmm. I just I just decided to go with one. And my face is very happy right now. <laughs> very few ingrown hairs and... Uh, yeah, just less ingrown hairs and less uh, face rage from my beard trying to grow back. <laughs> <laughs> We get enough rage playing video games. We don't need it from our faces. Mm. So, that was last week. Last I know week something. slash going into this week. I know something I forgot to mention last week. Possibly because it came Thursday. I finally got my Kindle. It's nice and shiny, and I can read it on the train. Hooray! And I'm only going to use it as a Kindle, mainly because I can't figure out how to do much other stuff with it. But I've tossed <laughs> all of the eBooks on here from all of the Humble Bundles. Nice. So I have an infinite amount of reading material. So you can and share my some... share my excitement. <laughs> yeah. Of actually being able to like. Uh, start thumbing through all these books that I've purchased and couldn't read. Like, literally could not read. It's a lot easier to read it on a screen like that, not only because I can change the font size to something I can see and because it's backlit so I can read it on the train in the tunnels, but the original old-school Kindle is just not bright enough for me. Mm. My eyes are too old. Can't do it. <laughs> and, and it's also nicer it? on my back when I commute. And what's nice about about the Kindle and the Kindle app, I guess the only uh, uh, ebook app that I know that gives you the option of uh, white text on black background which is well, not only which is I'm not, not only, the only one who does that no you're not the only one it's easier on my eyes and it's easier on my battery too <laughs> so it's a, it's a good twofer 
Like I feel, <laughs> I felt like I was going blind trying to read, <laughs> read on the white background. It's horrible. It's also a bit overkill with the white background when you're on the train in the tunnel because it just lights up the entire <laughs> row of seats. <laughs> it's a little rude. Yeah. The only downside to the fire over the old school Kindle is this thing can last about 10 hours or so if I just perpetually use it. The other Kindle, that thing will go for like two weeks. But really? The old school Kindle is just the pure it's text. The, uh, right, it's the, uh, the e-paper. Yeah, so it's, the e -ink. it barely uses any power. This is a proper tablet screen, so it pulls a bit more power. My battery really has not been an issue with uh, with my tablet, but then again, I have the uh, the uh, Nexus Seven, the uh, 2013 Nexus Seven, and it's just running a uh, a pure Android pure Android lollipop right now, so none of hmm. the extra fancy stuff. I haven't really pushed this one too much yet to see just what it can do. Mainly because I haven't had time. But I'll get to it. And it does actually have power management set up so it can save battery power. But yeah. Yay for ways to read books. Agreed. Oh, we got a <laughs> oh Lord. We got a comment here. Uh oh, dear. In, uh winter in reference to uh uh you playing Borderlands, I believe. Hey Charles, would you say that you and the moon have a rocky relationship? Boo <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had my sunglasses for that one. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, Charles, would you say that you and the moon have a rocky relationship? Yeah! <laughs> Worth it. That's going to be fun to animate. <laughs> 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 That's something else we did this week. Because of our like two hour long recording session for Muse Food stuff, we have like thirty minutes of animation gold. Nice. Which may make it into an NSFWN episode before I get time to actually animate any of it. <laughs> I'm sorry I missed out on that one, but I had no voice to uh, to help with the recording that at that point. Well, the highlights of that episode are in the recordings folder. Oh, it's like a 30-minute push... audio file. It's hilarious. <laughs> I'll go check that one out. And depending on what sort of content we have left for NSFW, and it might just make it into the next episode. <laughs> we'll talk about that off air. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, moving on. Events. There's two this month, back to back: Book Expo and Book Con. And. Myself, Calvin, and Justin are attending Book Expo as attendees and effectively as press because we get to interview peoples. Woohoo! And I'm just attending BookCon, and no interviews coordinated for that yet, but I'll see what I can do. They have been surprisingly uh, responsive in, from the uh, vendors and authors there trying to get in touch with people who are attending, see if there's any networking opportunities before the event even happens. So I'm kind of surprised by all that. Um, if you need, <clears throat> excuse me, if you do need me to uh, join in with that, I 
part of me does want to go because <laughs> it sounds like fun. Yeah, you're more than welcome to. Uh, BookCon is pretty cheap. I think it's 30 to $35 depending on the day. And oh, that one's BookCon. completely open to the public, so anyone can go. Yeah, we got a little taste of BookCon last year, and it, it was... It was actually kind of fun. <laughs> mm. And I know that um, a few people from NaNoWriMo HQ are going to be there again this year. I think for both conventions. So that's going to be fun. We should try to get an interview with them. That would be awesome. Work your magic. I'll see what I can do. Uh, we also have Kineticon coming up quicker than I'd like, considering all that we need to do for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be a fun discussion tomorrow. Eep. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, there are other conventions that we're vendoring at and still trying to coordinate and confirm press logistics. Fingers and, crossed. Yeah. And New York Comic Con is definitely the newest one on there, but purely as press because you can't get tickets. Yeah, no. Yeah, you just here's what. Can't. Here's, uh, here was my experience early today. Uh, jumped on the Jumped on the tickets page about 10 minutes before actually found the link where you can actually get into the queue loaded that up 12 o'clock rolled around I hit refresh I hit refresh again I hit refresh a few more times it gets me into the queue then my boss called me so I had to step out of my office <laughs> took care uh, went upstairs took care of that Came back downstairs, looked at uh, looked at the queue, only to find a, a 408 error, which is which is a bad request timeout. So in so while while my turn came in uh, came for the queue, because there are so many other people in the queue. My computer didn't uh, didn't have enough time to try to load the page, and timed out. Boo. After, after that point, I was like, you know what? I'm done. <laughs> I don't want to go anyway. I tried Makes refreshing sense. that page for about two minutes, and it just wouldn't even pretend to load. But I put both of our press submissions in before the whole thing crashed, so we'll see. In before chaos. <laughs> yes. Of course, if we both get press badges, that's going to get interesting because the, there's another convention that weekend that we've been invited to that I was going to ask for press logistics to, probably just for myself and other Connecticut-based peoples, considering it's a one-day con. But we can talk about that off air tomorrow. Okay. But yeah, basically, there's a lot of things going on this year, and we keep on getting invited to more. <laughs> they love us. They really love us. Or something like that. I don't know what's going on. It seems like every other week we're getting invited to a convention, or at least being told about a convention in our area. <laughs> Whatever we can do, and whatever we can record, so we can share it with all you peoples. Because exposure, and hilarity, and things of that nature. Yes. Oh man, if we get press for New York Comic Con, just imagine what we could do. We could do anything. Within legal reasons. Sure, why not? <laughs> A 
man, the lineup for New York Comic Con is uh, look looks pretty nice. I haven't even looked. Jill State is going to be there. And that makes me happy. That alone makes me happy. <laughs> I'm in. If we get the badges. <laughs> the creator of Naruto is going to be there. I think that's why Richie wanted me to go. Oh. Uh-huh. We'll see. I think there's like a three week wait before we learn if we got accepted or not. So sometime in June we'll find out. Maybe in time for our two year anniversary. Which would be nice. Uh, that'd be sweet. We still need to figure out just what we're doing for our two year anniversary. Because episode 97 is going to be a thing that happens. Because I'm not quitting before two years. <laughs> that would just be anticlimactic. Yeah, we'll figure out something fun to do. Maybe we can put together a fun retrospective. Yeah, we have enough content. But until then, I think it's about time we wrap up this episode before we distract each other again and derail our derailment. It's <laughs> fun oh, that um, hmm? uh, Richie chimed in in the comments. If you get pressed for New York Comic Con, I want an interview from Kishimoto. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. That would be nuts. I'm still curious oh. what we can get out of Kineticon, considering the guest list there. And that I know we have press badges for. Yeah. Well, we'll work something out. Yeah. But until then, time to wrap up the show. As always, if we have entertained you in any way, shape, or form over the last hour or so, you can show your appreciation through subscribing to our YouTube channel, where theoretically you're watching this if you're watching the video version of this podcast. You can also comment and thumbs up all the various shenanigans that we post, from the entire backlog of Word Ninjas Live, to our Game Break series, to all the various event shenanigans that we do, from press junkets to interviews to crew shenanigans to stuff that is supposed to be mead but is definitely not mead, and all sorts of other stuff. If you want to talk to us via social media, you can track us down on Twitter at FC Word Ninja. And if you use the hashtag Word Ninjas, you get bonus points. You can also follow us on Tumblr, fcwordninja.tumblr.com, or go check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash full coverage writers. And if you want to help fund all of our crazy shenanigans and endeavors, go check out our Etsy store. Etsy.com slash shop slash full coverage writers is chock full of all sorts of shiny baubles to entertain you and get your muse inspired and motivated. From buttons to bookmarks to booklets to word ninja writer's block plushies that stare at you judgingly until you are productive. And plenty of other things in the works. We have a whole slew of stuff that we're hoping to roll out this year, so keep checking back. And if you want to track me down personally, good luck with that. I'm running around like a headless chicken most of the time. Uh, you can track me down on my personal Tumblr, fancypantswolf.tumblr.com. 
or sometimes on the Fairy Tale Podcast uh, as Makarov on Monday nights, 10 p.m. time, on their channel. Hey, where can people find Will? You can usually find me on my Tumblr page at darkom.tumblr.com. It's D-A-R-K-H-O-M. Um, that's just where uh, it's my personal blog where I'm just... I always have it up and open for whatever reason. Uh, for information from My Roommate's a Stripper, you can go to MyRoommate'sAStripper.tumblr.com and you can support me at Patreon.com slash Darkholm. And where can people track down Calvin? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at CCWII and on Tumblr at Instacal.tumblr.com. And if you're up for some music, I almost forgot to mention that, I got a SoundCloud page, soundcloud.com slash soundsbycalvin. So there you have it. And with that, that is a show. That's an episode. As always, if you want to check out the full show notes or anything else that we do, go to fcwriters.com. It's all there. The entire backlog of everything. Well, there's like 80% of the audio episodes for Word Ninjas Live at this point. We're slowly filling out the backlog. We should be completely done by Kineticon. Or I will be sad. It happened. And... Calvin, did we actually say that the full backlog is now properly set up on our website and all that, so it should be a little better than it used to be because our previous hosting was weird? I don't remember if we talked about that last week. Uh, of all of our podcasts? Yeah. I don't think we did because I think we were all just dead. But don't we have a little more reliable RSS feed and coordination now that it's all internal? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, the, uh, the, new, uh, the new RSS feed is up and running. It is fcwriters.com slash podcast. I just checked. Everything is up and running and looking XML-like. So, And if you were previously subscribed to our iTunes feed and all that good stuff, it's the exact same one, so it should have automatically ported over. So you're not going to have to track down a new one. Yep. We did all the, uh, handy, uh, all the uh, heavy work in the background, so there should be uh, little, if any, interruption. Yes. But our primary concern in the past has been how much can we upload per month before we hit our limits. That limit is now gone, which is why we're filling out our backlog a lot better than we used to be able to. Yes. So go enjoy that. Go subscribe. Listen to the audio versions if you can't watch us on YouTube at any given moment. And in the meantime, until next week, go do something creative. Because why not? And then you can tell us about it next week. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>